Okay, good morning, everybody. We have a lot of work. We have a double, a double portion, and not the easiest parsha, but that's literally smack in the middle of the book of Leviticus, which is um, a book which is very detailed, not that much plot. Um, this story, this law, this parsha, more than other parshas, are even more technical and in some ways less relevant because a lot of the laws that we're going to discuss are not re really relevant today in the practical sense, but of course there, there's tremendous amount of spiritual significance and Kabbalistic meaning, and hopefully we'll uh, get to some of that. So as is our custom, I'm going to begin by reading um, from Chabad.org the, <clears throat> the portion in a nutshell, Hazriya Mitzora, it's a double portion in a nutshell. Um, in short, there was this form of impurity called Zara'at, which is sometimes translated as leprosy, but it is not the leprosy known today. It was um, more of a spiritual affliction, as we will discuss. And the Torah gives us a tremendous length, the details of the various forms of leprosy, the shades, the colors, and the purification, the, I'm sorry, the impurity that is brought about through the process of the leper, of the, of the Sarat of the leprosy, and then that's the first portion. And the second portion, it discusses the concept of the purity, that how the purity is brought about. You have to go to the priest and you have to go to the temple, et cetera, et cetera. So that's in short, the portion is about the impurity and purity of the Tzara'at. Uh, there are other details, but this is the big picture. So I'm going to read the nutshell um, as we do every Thursday. So here we go. The parshas of Tazriya and Mitzorah continue the discussion of the laws of Tuma Vitara, ritual impurity and purity. So it begins with a woman given, giving birth should undergo a process of purification, which includes immersing in a mikvah, a naturally gathered pool of water, and bringing offerings to the holy temple. All male infants are to be circumcised on the eighth day of life. So that's the first law, is the concept of birth, the purity, the impurity and purity that follows birth, and the circumcision. Then we move to the, what most of the Pasha discusses is that Sarat, often mistranslated as leprosy, is a supernatural plague which can afflict people as well as garments or homes. If white or pink patches appear on a person's skin, dark pink or dark green in garments or homes, a Kohen, the Kohen, the priest, is summoned, judging by various signs, such as an increase in size of the afflicted area after a seven-day quarantine, the Kohen pronounces it tame, impure, or tahor, pure. A person afflicted with Sarat must dwell alone outside of the camp or city until he is healed. The afflicted area in a garment or home must be removed. If that Sarat recurs, the entire garment or home must be destroyed. That's the first portion, the details of the tzarat. When the mitzorah, the leper, heals, he or she is purified by the Kohen with a special procedure invoking two birds, spring water in an earthen vessel, a piece of cedar wood, a scarlet thread, and a bundle of hyssop. Ritual impurity is also in engendered through a seminal or other discharge in a man, a menstruation or other discharge of blood in a woman, necess necessitating purification, through immersion in a mikvah. Okay, so there's a lot of purity and impurity here, a little esoteric, not so practical today, uh, at least on the surface, but as we mentioned, hopefully when we look at it from the Kabbalistic angle, there's a lot more relevance. So just for a, a, a technical note, because this, because this is a little complicated, so typically we open up the discussion for questions to, um, in segments, but if you want to jump in, you could unmute yourself and jump in just because of the nature of this specific parsha. Okay, a little bit of introduction. What is the mitzora? What does it mean? So let's give a little bit of an introduction of purity and impurity before we move, before we move to um, the concept of the specific impurity of tzara'at. So when you think about, when people think about impurity, people think about something negative, like I'm impure, I'm negative, there's something bad or wrong with me. And that when, from that perspective, when you read the opening phrase of the parsha, it's a little bit strange. So here you have a woman who just gave birth and she's impure. 
So I would uh, consider the giving birth to be a very uh, spiritual concept, a godly concept, a creative process. And here you tell me that giving birth brings about impurity. And th this, is co this, comes from, this really comes from a, mis a misunderstanding of what the Jewish concept of impurity and purity is. So from the Jewish perspective, the more holy something is a little bit of a paradox of purity and impurity. And the way it works is as follows. The more holy something is, the more susceptible it is to impurity. And therefore, if you tell me that something is impure, it means that the, 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 there's more holiness present within this person. So let me give you an example. To give you an example is that there's a, there's a mitzvah and when we wake up in the morning, we wash our hands. Why do we wash our hands? Because the code of law says, he quotes from the Zohar, that when a person goes to sleep, part of the soul um, sort of retreats and goes back to its source. And when part of the soul goes back to its source, what that does is it leaves a, a specific vacuum. It leaves a little bit of a vacuum of holiness within the body. And that's what impurity means. Impurity means a vacuum of holiness. And therefore, when the soul returns into the body, when a person wakes up, the person is once again pure. However, there's residue of impurity, and that's why we wash our hands. Okay, so that's what the Zohar says. So what does this really tell you? Something that is not holy to begin with, when it leaves, when, some, when, it, when, when something that's not holy in, to begin with is not susceptible to impurity. Because again, the concept of impurity is that there was a tremendous it was a level of holiness that is now, um, that is now have been, has been minimized. So now there's, a, now there's a vacuum of holiness, and the vacuum pulls in, neg pulls in negative forces. But something that never had that holiness to begin with is not susceptible to impurity. There's no problem. There's no vacuum to begin with. So Let's think about um, the opening part of the parsha. Okay, so let's think about so 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 so. What, what is we, what is the practical implications of impurity? So it's fascinating to contemplate. Let's say I'm impure. What what are the ramifications in my life? The answer is there are no ramifications in my life because today all of us are ritually impure. In the times of the temple, there were there were there were ramifications. The ramifications were that if I'm impure, I'm not allowed to go to the temple in Jerusalem, and I'm not allowed to eat of the offerings in the temple because I am impure. But, but there is no mitzvah to be pure. The mitzvah is that if I want to be pure, I, I should follow this process, and I, if I want to go to the temple, I have to follow this process. Okay, that's the concept of, so, so that's something about, about purity and impurity. There is a one, so going to the temple, because going to the temple is, I'm trying to become more holy and closer to God, then I have to grow and make sure that I'm completely pure. Okay. Where else is there impurity that's practical today? So if you look at the final point that we mentioned, in the nutshell, so there was, there's one more area of purity and impurity that applies today, and that is for the relationship between man and his wife. The menstruation cycle brings about impurity. So before we get into that, I'm going to address it for a minute or two, but before we get into that, what do you see here? You see here that there's two places where, I, where purity matters. What are the two places? The temple is number one, the temple in Jerusalem, holiness. And the other area, surprisingly, is the relationship between man and wife. Okay, so what does that tell you? That tells you that from Judaism's perspective, the relationship between, between man and wife is, in a sense, a temple. That's the place where the divine presence dwells. It sounds strange because, because a lot of what we think about intimacy comes from, from the perspective of other faiths. But from the perspective of Judaism, the unity between male and female is in fact a holy act. That's why it's called Kedusha. Betrothal is called Kedushin, which means holiness. And it's fascinating that the two areas where purity and purity, impurity matter is if I'm going to the temple or if I'm going to... Um, toward intimacy with a spouse. So that's a fascinating concept in itself. Okay, going back to birth for a moment, and after we do this, we'll talk, we'll open up the floor for a few questions, and then maybe we'll, and then we'll go to the tzarat, which is what I really want to talk about. So let's think about birth for a second. Seemingly, the process of birth is the process that is the most spiritual process a person can engage in, because the process of birth is the process of giving life and a creation. We're mo we're mo the, the, the human being or the woman is most like God when you can create. 
So giving birth seemingly to be a tremendous amount of holiness, which it is. So why is there associated with impurity? So the answer is, of course, as we mentioned, that the idea of impurity means that there was a, a, there was a powerful sense of holiness, and now there's a certain degree of a vacuum. And what does that mean? That means that when the, pers- when the woman was pregnant, she had the life within herself. When she gives birth, that life now has left her, her. If it left her, there is a certain amount of vacuum. And that vacuum could have negative ramifications. And therefore, the vacuum has to be filled with um, holiness. And therefore, that's the process of purification, which spiritually means make sure that the vacuum is drawing in positive energy and not negative energy, which is another very important concept. You know, people think that, you know, the, the, the people know, people have identified destructive forces in our life. You know, why, do I, why, why am I engaged in destructive matters? Because... Um, I don't know, have negative influences. That could be so. But one thing that we don't always pay attention to is that often when a person is engaged in something destructive, let's say it's a, it's a habit, let's say it's an addiction, many times the drive and the negativity is not something, it's nothing, it's the vacuum. Because I don't have any meaning in my life, because my school shut down, so instead of studying, I'm sitting at home, and I have nothing to do, so the vacuum, don't, we, we have, science tells us that the, that the power of a vacuum is tremendous, and it can pull in all negative sources. So my job is to make sure that I have no vacuum in my life. Very often, a, a, an addiction is just an expression of a vacuum, and that's the impurity. And how do I become pure? By, make, by filling the vacuum with positivity, and that's the process of purification. So because there's a lot going on here, We'll open up the floor to discussion. If somebody wants to ask a question, it's wonderful. If not, we'll move on and we'll go to the Sara'at. Okay, so what's the tzarat? What's the leprosy? The leprosy is as follows. The leprosy is, um, in some cases, it's the most severe form of impurity. Why am I saying that? Because it's the only form of impurity, as Jill mentioned, that the, the Torah commands that a person who has this form of leprosy has to go outside the camp. And not only has to be outside the camp, but he has to be sit alone outside the camp. I typically, if you want to quarantine people because of a plague, what you do is you take all the people who are sick and you put them together and you put up a wall and you keep and you separate the sick people from the healthy people, right? Um, the Torah doesn't say that. The Torah says the purpose is not to create isolation between the, 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 the healthy population and the unhealthy population. The purpose is like the Torah says, Badad Yeshev, the person with the tzarat, with the leprosy, should sit in solitude. So it's not about being separate from the healthy people. It's about being alone, having some alone time. Now, what is this tzarat? What is what's happening here? So virtually all the commentators explain that the tzarat was a spirit, was an affliction that was, uh, was almost unnatural, a supernatural, and it came to somebody who engaged in slander. The word mitzora literally comes from the word motzira. He's giving out evil. Someone talking evil, slander, or other forms of, of gossip would be afflicted by the tzarat and under certain circumstances forced to sit apart and alone from everybody else. Now this is a fascinating concept because in the, you know, the reason everybody wants to know how come the um, during this horrible outbreak of the corona, how come the um, Jewish community in general, but maybe the Orthodox community in particular, is, it was afflicted so, 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 so intensely? And maybe they weren't as careful as they should have been, maybe they were, but the truth of the matter is that it's because the community, the Jewish community, almost by design, is integrated with each other. And the worst punishment and the worst crime you could do in other words, the worst punishment it's the contrary to literally to the way we live as a community so all the jewish people are sitting together you could be a sinner you could be impure with other forms of purity 
But you're not, you're, not, you're not quarantined alone. The only person who's quarantined alone is the person, which is like I said, the worst form of, probably the worst form of punishment is the person who engages in gossip. And what happens here? What's happening here? Gossip or slander, what's happening here? So what's happening here is as follows. We, we, we realize that for people to have a community, to have civilization, to live together, we need to have a social fabric. And we understand that what's, what's the most dangerous thing for the social fabric? So people would think if a person is a thief, a person's a murderer, the Torah says no. The most dangerous thing for, for social fabric is slander and gossip. Why? Because what happens is people who trust each other or trusted each other yesterday now are torn apart. So a person engaging in slander and gossip is literally walking around the community, tearing the social fabric up into pieces, shredding it into pieces. And therefore the Torah sees that as so extreme and so, so negative that we have no other choice but to take the most drastic move and put that person in isolation. And again, we're not trying to punish the person, but what happens when the person is in isolation? What happens is that person then starts to realize how difficult it is to stay, sit alone, how difficult it is to be on your own. And now that person, when the person will be purified, the person then would now once again re-enter the community, but he does so with the newfound appreciation for the value of of, of relationships and people's connections and social and the social and the social fabric, and therefore the person is now uh, rehabilitated because now he understands the power and the uh, and the holiness and the importance of the community. So this is just why why the Torah would spend so much time, literally two portions on the concept. Of the of the and isolated and how we bring them back into the community because this is not just another <clears throat> this is not just a character flaw you know there are many character flaws some people are are arrogant <clears throat> some people are arrogant some people lie some people cheat there are many character flaws but the Torah is hinting to us that there's no character flaw that will destroy the fabric of the community as slander and gossip or evil speech in general and I think this is also true about not just the community as a whole, but within a person's uh, small community. So within a person's own family, um, the words a person chooses to make say make all the difference. I could say the same thing in a nice way that will build people, or I could say the same thing in a harsh way that will tear people down. And we know we discussed this. We, we, we know that the Torah says how when God creates the world, God creates the world through speech. Right? There were 10 utterances. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be a firmament, and there was a firmament. So the sages say that just like God creates the world through speech, so the righteous, meaning the people, also create the world with speech. And the way we choose to speak really influences the type of environment that we have. If we speak words that help people, that, bring, that, 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 that highlight the positivity within people, we'll express those aspects and bring that out within the people around us. If we label people and label activities with, in a negative way, that's, that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, a few years ago, when I wrote about this parsha, I found a study that said something very interesting. So if the doctor is talking to the patient about, about a potential surgery, so it's all about the words. This is highlighting the point that the way we speak actually impacts people's decisions and how people think about life. So... If the doctor would tell the, this too, the, so, so they do the study. Where in one case, the doctor tells the patient, this surgery has 90% a success rate. On the other scenario is they tell the same surgery, they tell the patient, there's 10% chance that you're not going to survive this surgery, right? So in both cases, the doctor said the same facts, 90% success rate, 10% uh, uh, mortality. And yet, when the doctor said you have 90% success rate, the patient was three times more likely to elect to do the surgery, right? Same facts, presented differently, and it has a real-world effect in the real world of how we think about reality. So it's true in, uh, if you got to get someone to do a surgery, but it's true about, it's true about, um, 
It's true about speech in general, that the energy, when we speak, we create certain energies, and that's why the concept of positive speech is so important to Judaism. It reminds me of a story that after the Rebbe had a heart attack in 1977, the doctor said if he doesn't take, if he doesn't slow down his workload, there's going to be a 75% chance that he will have another heart attack. So the Rebbe said, really? So you're telling me if I continue my workload, there's 25% chance that I won't have another heart attack? That's wonderful news. And that's in fact what happened. I mean, he did slow down, but he didn't have another heart attack. But again, it's all the way we frame, the way we frame reality with words really affects how the reality we're going to live in. And um, in quarantine, this is something I tried to teach my, myself and also to my children because this is very important because we are, in some sense, we're actually more in a community now because we're literally in one community. Everybody's in their own home. It's not like I can run out and go join a different community uh, temporarily and not come back until the evening. We're literally in a community together and we sense that the idea of, of togetherness is critical and the way we maintain that sense of togetherness is through positive speech. And it just takes one person to say one sentence that's negative and that can create a tremendous amount of tension. And sometimes that, and sometimes um, this Parsha is here to tell us to give us space to recognize the, the, the importance of this interconnection between people and, and, and creating a community within society, but within one's own family and the importance of it. And a critical way of doing so is through being cognizant of the speech we use. So that is again, an introduction about the concept of Sarat, of of the leprosy and why a person would be sent out of the camp. And now we'll hopefully try to engage a little bit more on the spiritual side, um, but maybe we'll open up the floor for a question or two. Let's see if I can. Slide. You did. You know. Okay. So if you want to talk about the story of Sarat from the spiritual perspective, um, when the Kabbalist, there's a, lot, a tremendous amount of Kabbalah in this portion, and I'm going to try to distill it in a way that at least will make some sense. Hopefully I'll be successful with God's help. So if you, if you look at, at the story of, if you look from the Kabbalistic perspective at life, everything in life, so in, everything in reality, doesn't, nothing, almost nothing starts in this physical world. From the Kabbalistic perspective, there are many spiritual worlds, and every world are higher worlds and lower worlds, and we're sort of the bottom of the rung. The physical world, the physical universe that we live in is the lowest dimension of reality. But there are higher dimensions, more spiritual dimensions of reality. And in those dimensions of reality, um, the higher you go, the less evil there is in, the world, in that spiritual reality, but there are still certain negative traits and negative phenomenon and those have to be corrected. The key here is as follows. The key here, when something negative happens in this world, it almost never begins in this world. It starts with some, I don't want to call it a bug, but some bug or something that's not, that is in, out of harmony and out of sync in the spiritual worlds. See what I'm saying? So because there's a spiritual problem in the spiritual worlds, that's why down here, I can't get along with my neighbor. And that's why down here, I'm speaking gossip about the ankle, right? So where does it start from? Nothing emerges in a vacuum. Nothing starts out, of, no, nothing is just created here in this world out of, out of nowhere, out of thin air. There are spiritual energies and spiritual phenomenons taking place in the spiritual worlds. When those trickle down here, they are going to express themselves in negative ways, but in their source, they're not so negative, but they're not, but, but they're not fully in sync. Now, so just to make sure this is not too esoteric, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to give you an application of what I mean. So let's say I'm a person, I can't get along with anybody, right? I can't get along with my neighbors. My neighbors happen to be fine people, so I'm not really talking about myself. But I mean, let's say, let's think the theoretical scenario where I can't get along with my neighbors. So I go to my shrink, and he asks me, why can't you get along with my neighbor? I say, my neighbor, terrible person. And then my other neighbor, oh, bigger problem. And I find fault with everybody in the world, except of course with myself. So I can't go, I can't go, I, I cannot get along with my neighbors. So I go to the shrink and I hope that the shrink is gonna teach me how to interact, how to make peace between me and my neighbor, okay? Now, 
one way to answer it is go figure out some some figure out some ways to uh, mediate between me and my neighbors and make peace. Fine, but that's dealing with the symptom. If you want to deal with the core, what the shrink should tell me, it's got nothing to do with your neighbors. It's not that I can't get along with my neighbors. It's I cannot get along with myself. In other words, within my soul, there is no harmony. And because there's no harmony within my soul, therefore, I cannot figure out how to be harmonious with somebody outside myself because I didn't figure out how to harmonize the various uh, tensions within myself. So if you're going to a spiritual shrink, what the person should tell you is, before you try to figure out what's going on with your neighbor, figure out what's going on with yourself. And that's what the Kabbalah is doing. The Kabbalah, when the Kabbalists study this Parsha, they said, look, we have a problem here. The problem is that this gentleman can't get along with his neighbor. He's speaking slander. So the Kabbalists say, you know what the problem is? And they start giving Kabbalistic solutions because in the spiritual world, what they're doing is they're trying to treat the core. They're trying to, to, treat, to treat the core of the problem, not the symptom. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a minute or two in telling you what the Kabbalists believe is the core of the problem. In other words, in its source, and then how it trickles down into this world. And then I'm going to try to show you how we'll do the same within my, my own self. If I, cannot, um, if I cannot get along with my neighbor, one place to look is at my neighbor. But the other place to look is within myself, as, as I mentioned earlier. And hopefully, with the help of Hashem, I will try to demonstrate this and make this at least somewhat um, coherent. So I'm first going to tell you a line or two of the Kabbalah, what the Kabbalah does on this parsha. It sounds completely esoteric and has no relevance to the pshat, to the simple meaning. But we know, and I don't want to get into it right now, but in the Torah, we know we're supposed to have a whole, the, the, we know that in the Torah, I mentioned, I think I mentioned it yesterday, I didn't mention it yesterday, that in the, the, the Kabbalah teaches that the highest level is connected to the lowest level. The beginning is etched in the end and the end is etched in the beginning. So in our context, the most spiritual dimension of Torah, the most esoteric part of Torah, is connected to the most practical. So when you read the most esoteric part of the Torah, on one hand, it just seems esoteric, but the truth is it has practical applications more than the other parts of Torah. Here, I'm going to try to demonstrate it, and we'll see what happens. Says the Kabbalah as follows. The problem with the Mitzorah here, so the guy goes, the, the guy had leprosy, or this form of leprosy. So if he goes to the if he goes to the simple reading, the rabbis, if he goes to Rashi and the Rambam, he says, Rashi, why do I have leprosy? The Torah tells me I have leprosy. Why do I have leprosy? So Rashi and the Rambam will give him the same diagnosis. They'll say, you know why you have leprosy? You have leprosy because you spoke slander. Fine, I understand. That makes sense. Now I know the diagnosis. The Hasidim would say that a diagnosis is 50% of the cure. If you go to the doctor, and he didn't give you a cure, but he gave you the right di di diagnosis, it's worth, it's worth the money, 50% of the cure. Problem is when you go to the doctor and he gives you the wrong diagnosis, then you're really in trouble. So I go to Rashi and Rambam and I say, what is, what's, my, what's my diagnosis? What's the problem? Why do I have this tzorat? They say, well, you speak slander. Fine, I know what that means. At least I know, I know how to fix it. Let's say I go to the Kabbalists. I go to the Zohar and I say, why do I have this tzorat? You ready for the answer? The answer is like this. The answer is, the problem with you is that you don't have enough chachma, you don't have enough wisdom, you have too much bina, too much understanding, not enough wisdom. Okay? And I'm just speaking Kabbalah here, so it's not, if it doesn't make sense, that's okay. They say as follows, what's, the, what's the, the discoloring on the skin was that the discoloring of, of the, the skin was that you have too much white, is not enough red. Okay? In short, what they're saying is that white represents chachma wisdom, humility, okay, chachma wisdom, and bina represents understanding and comprehension. And what they're really saying is that the various forces of the spherot in your soul are not in balance. So your chachma, your wisdom, separated from your bina, from your understanding. And what's the, what's the cure? The cure is you have to go to the Kohen, to the priest. And what the Kohen will do for you is the Kohen represents Chachma wisdom. And the Kohen will help your wisdom get re in sync with the other spherot of Bina and the other spherot. 
So this was a little bit, uh, a little bit esoteric, but I'm going to explain it. So to summarize, in short, if I go to Rashi and the Rambam and I say, why do I have leprosy? They're going to say you have leprosy because you're speaking slander. If I go to the, to, to the, Ari, to the Zohar, the Zohar says, look, there's an imbalance within your spirit, within your soul powers. So what does that mean? So this requires an introduction, but hopefully it will be uh, interesting. So hopefully we'll discuss this next week also. The discourse of the Hasidic discourse that I want to discuss next week is also going to be on this topic. But you heard about it, a little bit about it, certainly if you've been here. There's the concept in the Kabbalah where, the, where we call it the concept of chaos and order. And there's two systems where the ten spheroids could align. And one is holy and one is unholy. And in holiness, the ten spherot align in order, meaning to say they are integra integrated one with the other, as opposed to the ten spherot that create the unholiness. The ten when the, when the ten spherot create the unholiness, they are not integrated with each other, and because they're not integrated with each other, they create chaos. What do I mean? So let's try to illustrate this. So we, we, we discussed the 10 spherot this week, so I don't want to repeat the 10 spherot, but let's give a simple example. A simple example is that let's say there's a person who's a very kind person, but that person never doesn't, have, doesn't know how to awaken and express the discipline in his or her life. So we understand that even though kindness is a very good quality, but kindness that is only kindness and will not make room for any discipline is going to create chaos. Think about unguided un, 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 un giving. You give everybody to the wrong people to the wrong times. You give your love to the wrong places in the wrong times. That's going to create chaos. If I'm disciplined to the extreme, it's also going to create chaos. If I have two parents living in the same home and one wants to always give and the other wants to always hold back, and each one is very strong in their opinion of, of what should be done, what's going to happen is there's going to be a clash, and the clash will create chaos. If you have a board of directors of a company, and every person on the board has a different quality, and everybody is very strong and very passionate about their perspective to the extent that they're not willing to make compromise with other people, the company is going to fall apart. Because, because order happens when you have various energies, but those energies are willing to integrate with other energies, meaning to say are willing to take, um, in, to, to be influenced by the others. So if I'm a person who always performs kindness and my spouse says, look, you have to discipline yourself, I'm still going to be a kind person, but I have to allow for some of that discipline to enter into my, my life. And if only when I integrate the various aspects of my soul could I have a degree of, 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 of tikkun, what we call of order of positive, positive and productive life. Okay. So going back to the unholy spherot, what happens in the unholy spherot, because they're so intensely connected to their source, the person who feels kindness feels kindness completely and does not want to make any compromise for discipline. And the person who believes in discipline does not want to make any compromise for the person who believes in kindness. And if you need a, me a metaphor, to take a metaphor of a political system where you have two people who really believe, two parties who really believe in their ideology to the extent that they cannot make any compromise. So if they cannot make any compromise, you're going to have, what are you going to have? You're going to have dysfunction. You're going to have deadlock and dysfunction. And within the person, it's going to happen as well. Now, says the Kabbalah, this looks like actually a very great thing. The person is so kind, he's so committed to kindness, he doesn't want to make any compromise. The Kabbalah says, no, it's not holy. It's not that you're so dedicated to, comp to, 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 to kindness. What's really happening here is that I, the person is in a state of arrogance. And because he's in arrogance, he doesn't have the humility to understand that there's another perspective and the other perspective can help his own. Okay? So now let's, re let's, let's go back to the Kabbalah. What does the Kabbalah say is the problem of the Mitzvah? So down here you have a guy who's running around speaking slander. So the Rashi and Rambam say, stop speaking slander. But the Kabbalists say, what does this come from? Where does it come from that a person should not be able to integrate with somebody else? 
Where does this problem come from? What's the origin of the problem that a person cannot integrate with society? The answer is because in the spiritual worlds, there are energies, very powerful energies that do not have enough humility and they cannot integrate with each other. And that problem, when it trickles down and comes down to this world, creates that I'm too arrogant to integrate the perspective of my neighbor and therefore I can't get along with my neighbor. So what is the, what is the, what, what is the cure? The cure has come to the priest that the priest teaches humility. The water is humility. The mikvah is humility. And in that sense, when I do so, two things happen. First of all, I get to learn, I figure out how to get along with my neighbor. But more importantly, I figure out how to integrate the various feelings, the various soul powers within myself. So if you think about it, what's the difference between a child and an adult in their emotional state? So children are very much in tune to their emotions. If they're upset right now, they're completely upset. With children, they're so intense, right? The child wanted a candy and didn't get a candy. The, the world has is, is come to an end. Like they cry completely. And when they love, they love completely, right? The child in one second says, I love you like nothing, and the next minute he hates you. Okay, so children love intensely. A child's emotion typically is immature because they cannot feel complex emotions. If they, I don't know if they can't, they're less likely to feel complex emotions. They're, more, they're much more black and white. If I love it, I love it completely. If I hate it, I hate it completely. I don't want to label children, but that's sort of immature emotion in the sense that there's no integration. A person who's more intellectual, a person who's more mature, that even the emotion, the emotion is more integrated, right? So something negative happens, I say, well, th this hurts me, this causes pain, but I also see that there could be a silver lining. I could see that there's positivity here. So an adult, when something happens, even though he's upset, something negative happens, even though he's upset, it's not the end of the world. Why is it not the end of the world? Because I can keep my emotions in balance. And the way I keep my emotions in balance is because I have the overarching idea of wisdom. So I don't allow myself to be completely focused just on one emotion. I integrate the various aspects of my life into one whole. Says the Kabbalah, if you have more chachma, if you have the wisdom, if you have the humility, and you're able to integrate the various aspects of your soul into, your, in, into, one, in, in, into harmony, then what's going to happen is you will also be able to get along with your neighbor. Because in a sense, why can't I get along with my neighbor? Because my perspective is so different than the other's perspective. But if I learn within myself to realize that there are various perspectives that need to be integrated in, this, in myself, then I also know how to do it with my family, and then from my family to my community. So what I tried to do here, I hope I was at least somewhat successful, tried to show that the, various, the, 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 the diverging explanations of the psha, of the simple meaning. Simple meaning is this guy's running around speaking gossip. And then there's a spiritual Kabbalistic interpretation, which is the Mitzvah represents that the person's own, that, that the spheros are, out of, are not integrated. And when a person feels love, he feels love completely, and there's no room for discipline. And when a person feels discipline, he feels no room for love. And what they're missing is, they're missing is the integration of the Chachma, which brings about the humility, which brings about the integration between the person's own internal emotions. That is one and the same explanation. One is the source and one is the symptom. So again, if I, get, if I learn to integrate the various opposing energies within myself, then I will know how to get along with the people around me. So when I'm upset at my family member for being so different than me, what I really have to work on is figuring out how to integrate the various opposing aspects of my soul and creating that harmony within myself. If I create the harmony within myself, I can hopefully then move to create the harmony within other people, or it can also work the other way around. I'm not saying you have to start with yourself. If I have a very difficult neighbor and I learn to get along with them, or at least to, create, to be civil with them, that requires humility. And that humility will then allow me to be able to recreate the harmony within myself. So it either goes from within to without or from without to within. Either way can work, right? If I cure the symptom, I can get to the cause. If I cause the, cure the cause, I can get to the symptom. The point is, if there's humility in my life, in, in, um, in my interaction with my neighbor, that will trickle back, trickle up to humility within myself. And if I introduce it within myself, 
it should also trickle out to my behavior, to my interaction with my neighbor. 